I am really especially glad that you are here today because out of the whole week, if you had to miss one meeting, today would not be the one to miss. If any meeting, if any story is the most important about how our church began, today would be the one. Today is very special because it is part of the identification of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, just a quick review. Back in the 1830s, 1840s, was William Miller, when he was preaching, were there other churches, were there other denominations? Yes, who, who can name one? Put up your hand and I'll call on you. Name a denomination. Yes, there were Baptists. Yes, there were Methodists. Yes, in the orange shirt. Oh, okay. Um, not quite yet. The Adventists came from there, yeah. There were Millerites, but another church maybe? There were Catholics. That's right, there were lots of other churches. One more, the boy there in the black shirt with, the, yeah? Presbyterians, the last one. You're, what? Buddhist, did you say? Yes, yes. You know, in other, in other countries, you're right. There are, there are other religions. Not so much here in America, especially back then, but in other countries, absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. Okay. Well, if there were so many other churches, did God need another church? What do you think? Did God need another church when there are already Baptists and Methodists and Catholics and Presbyterians and in other countries, Buddhists and Muslims and lots? Why did he need another church? Yes, he needed another church to give his end time message. And this was prophesied in the Bible. Now, I need two volunteers to come up. One girl right here and one boy right there. Okay, and I have something very, very special. I hope you have good eyes. Good eyes because this is a very old Bible, very old. In fact, it's not a whole Bible, it's the New Testament. And it is well over 100 years old. It could have very well been used by some of our pioneers. And there are two texts that talk about, can you believe it, they were written in the book of Revelation about 2,000 years ago by John, and it is talking about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Can you believe it? The Seventh-day Adventist Church is in the Bible, and we are going to read it right now. If you have something to write with, write it down. If not, remember this. The first one is Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and you can just, what is your name? Lucia. Lucia, thank you so much for reading. Now you see, Revelation 12, 17, can you read in a nice, strong voice that text right there? And the dragon was worth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's right. Thank you very much. Just a sec. That is a very important verse. It talks about the remnant, the remnant. And there were two special things that this verse tells us about the remnant. Did you catch it? Who can tell me the first one? Yes. They keep the commandments of God. Were at the time in the 1800s, were there other churches 
who knew about the seventh day Sabbath and were keeping it? Yes. Who, for example? Okay, Jews, you're right. They, they do, and they did keep the Sabbath. And the second one was the Seventh-day Baptist. But there was a second characteristic. What is it? Right, some, some translations say the faith of Jesus. Others say the testimony of Jesus. So in this verse, we read they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. Now, very important question. What is the testimony of Jesus? That's a really good guess. Testimony to the church? It's part of that. You're absolutely right. Anyone else? Well, the Bible answers this question for us. Aren't you glad the Bible gives us the answers that we need? And now it's your turn. What does he mean? Aiden. Aiden. Aiden is going to read for us, and it is found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Okay, can you see? It's so little, it's hard to find it, at least with my eyes. <laughs> OK, just a second. Sometimes modern ones are easier. Okay, Aiden, can you read this for us? This is Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. And this is John speaking. Then I fell at his then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you, and you are brothers who hold the to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Very good. Thank you, Aiden, very much. So according to the Bible, what is the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. That is what our story is about today. What is the spirit of prophecy? And we are going to meet a lady by the name of Ellen White and hear about when she ran away from God, or at least tried to. Good afternoon, girls. I am, can you quiet me down a little bit? I am so glad to be here with you. I'm telling you, I had four boys when I was a young mother, and the boys are about, we're about your age, and we love to go horseback riding and play in the woods and have a picnic, and it was just so much fun. But I want to tell you a story about how I tried to run away from God. Now, use your hands. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question this afternoon. Do you know anyone in the Bible who tried to run away from God? All right, you in the pink? Yes, and raise your hand if you know where God found him. Yes. In a boat, at the bottom of the boat, is that correct? Well, I'm going to tell you what. God gave me my first vision. Do you know what a vision is? It's like a video. You sit down, you watch a video. Well, God gave me a vision. And it was, this is, this is kind of what the vision was. I was, I was standing there, and it was a, a group of people going up a long pathway. And behind the group, there was a bright light, and they were on their way to the holy city. 
And, and when I got done seeing this beautiful heavenly video that God gave me, God said, now, Sister Ellen, I want you to go tell everybody what you just heard, what I just showed you. And I said, mm-mm, not me. <clears throat> I'm only 17 years of age. That was back in the day. I'm only 17 years of age. And you know what? People are going to think I'm crazy. My friends are not going to understand. I do not want to do this, God. And I'll tell you why I didn't want to do it. Not only because I was so young, but because, well, we had just experienced the great disappointment. In Portland, Maine, there were a group of people who thought there was a huge mistake. And this great disappointment it, it happened October 22, 1844. We thought Jesus would come, but he didn't. We waited and we waited and we waited till midnight. And he didn't show up. And we said, oh no, what happened? And so then God gave me this vision and he wanted me to tell those people. And I said, no, Lord, not me. I'm weak. I'm only 17 and no one is going to believe me. And so... I said, Lord, please, please don't make me do this. Please, Lord, I love you with all of my heart, but I don't want to tell the story. Ellen knew that there was going to be a prayer meeting at her house that very night, and she would be asked to share it. And she was determined she was not going to share it. So she ran out of the house, she went to the barn, she grabbed the horse and the sleigh, hooked them up, got into the sleigh, and quickly went to her friend's house a couple of miles away. She ran out, she ran into her friend's house, and there was one of the Advent leaders, one of the men who had been in the Millerites, but he was faithful to God. He was an Advent believer. His name was Brother Joseph Turner. And Ellen said, Brother Turner, what are you doing here? And he looked at her and was wondering, well, Ellen, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be, isn't there a prayer meeting at your house tonight? Well, yes. Well, aren't you going to share something? Well, no. And she quickly ran up to the bedroom of her friend. She ran in, she shut the door. She didn't want to see Brother Turner. And there she prayed and prayed, said, no, God, I cannot do it. It's so embarrassing. My friends are going to make fun of me. The older people are going to think I'm crazy. I will not do it. I will not do it. But Brother Turner came up. After a while, there's a knock on the door. Ellen opened the door, and there was Brother Turner. Ellen, don't you think the Lord would like you to share this message? Well, yeah. Don't you think he'll help you? Well, I don't know. I don't want to. And Brother Turner tried to encourage her and left. And so she was there, and she thought about it, and she prayed about it. And she thought, well, maybe I better go home. So later she went back down, went out, got the horse and the sleigh, got in, and she rode back to her home. But by the time she got back home, the meeting had just finished. She came in, and no one said anything to her about where she had been. But she prayed some more, and she said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm weak, but you are strong, and you can help me. If you have called me, you will give me the strength to do it. And she surrendered to God, and she was willing to tell. And that was the beginning of a very special ministry of the spirit of prophecy. Because you see, even though Ellen Harmon at that time, she was a person just like we are. 
She had thoughts and feelings very much like what we have. She had a family. She ate. She slept. She was like us in many ways. But God chose her as his special messenger and gave her visions, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Now, in 1844, when she had her first vision, did Ellen White know about the Sabbath? What do you think? Were they keeping the seventh day Sabbath? They weren't, but she was soon to find out about it. And again, as you know the story, because you said about Rachel Oaks, and she talked to who? Who did she talk to? And what about Brother Bates? What did Brother Bates do? A little bit later, Brother Bates also told many people about the Sabbath. Well, Ellen, as we saw, married James White, and she became Ellen White's sister White. And they both accepted the Sabbath. And then on April 3, 1847, Ellen White writes a letter to Joseph Bates, who had brought the Sabbath message. Let's hear what she said. What did she write in the letter? She'll share it with us right now. You know, boys and girls, no matter how far we run from God, he knows where we're at. And um, God found me in Topsham, Maine, and, and I, I, was at, I was there, and he impressed me that I didn't have to say it, but if I could just write it down to Joseph Bates and see what would happen from there. So I got my desk, I sat at my desk, and I picked up my pen, and I wrote, Dear Brother Bates, last Sabbath, we met with our brothers and sisters at, at, at Brother Helen's. We called everybody brother and sister back then because we were one big family. Brother Helen's here in Maine, and we felt an unusual spirit of prayer. In fact, as it went on, we felt the Holy Spirit was, was falling on us, was actually impressing us. And the interesting thing was, boys and girls, soon I became lost and wrapped up in another of God's videos, in another vision. And, and I, was, I was watching, and I, I saw an angel flying swiftly to me. And he just not only flew swiftly, but he, he picked me up, and he took me to the heavenly city. And I, I'm writing all this down to Joseph Bates. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And the veil was raised, and I passed into the most holy place of the temple. I, I went to the temple in heaven. That's where the angel dropped me off. And the veil was raised, and I went in, and I saw an altar of incense. Have you heard of that before? Yeah? That's in heaven. And, and I saw the seven-branch candlestick, and I saw the table of showbread. I mean, it was amazing. It was so, so beautiful. And then something wonderful happened. The veil was raised. I met Jesus face to face. It makes me cry every time. It was so wonderful. And, and he raised the veil. And I passed into the most holy place. And in there, it was beautiful. In the holiest of holies, there Jesus was. I saw an ark, and on the top of it, there were two angels, and it was pure gold. And there were two angels, and they had their wings bent and their heads down toward this very bright light. And oh, I gotta keep writing this down because I'm writing it to Elder Bates, but I get excited about it every time I, I have to recall it. And then between the angels was a golden censer, and above the ark stood an exceeding bright glory that appeared like a throne where Jesus dwells. And Jesus stood by the ark. Oh, it was beautiful. And of course, Sister White wanted to see what's inside of this ark. What is inside? She saw the outside. It was just like how the Bible describes the ark. What might be in there? And all of a sudden, the lid was lifted and 
and amazingly, what, what happened? What did you see? I'm still writing this to Brother Bates because he wants to hear about it too. But inside the ark was a golden pot of manna. Yes. If there was a golden pot of manna, you would think it would have dried up and blown away a long time ago. But we're in heaven, and everything stays fresh and alive. And Aaron's rod that buttered, it was there. It was so amazing. And then, my friends, my young friends, there was the table the tables of the, of the Ten Commandments, the tablets. And Jesus opened them to me, and I looked, and there were four commandments on the left, and the other six were on the right. But the interesting thing is, is that on the left, where it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, it shone the brightest. And I said, wow, that's interesting because I had, had hardly heard about the seventh day Sabbath and the fourth commandment, but I knew there was something there that I needed to learn when I was out of my vision. I shared all of this with Pastor Joseph Bates, and a halo of glory was all around the Ten Commandments. It was beautiful. Sister White was so excited with this vision, and so was Brother Bates. But there was more studying to be done because, of course, for this new movement that God was raising up, would these be beliefs? Would they be based just on the visions of Ellen White? What do you think? No, what were the beliefs of this new movement, this new church? What were they based on? The Bible, that's right. And so the early pioneers, they would come together with their Bibles. And Ellen White tells us sometimes they would study and study all night long. They would read a text and pray, Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean? They would pray. They would wrestle. They would compare scripture with scripture. And she tells us only when they would come to a point where they couldn't understand it anymore then the Lord would give her a vision to understand what is the meaning of this. And he gave her this special vision about the Sabbath to assure her and the others that this was right, that this was still valid, that the Ten Commandments were still in the ark in heaven and that they were important. Well, you know, God gave her other other visions, things that were totally against what the doctors were saying at that time. If you had a bad cough or you couldn't breathe, you know what the doctors would prescribe for you? They'd say you need to smoke, that the smoke will help clear out your lungs. What do you think of that? Is that going to help? Of course not. You know that. I know that. But back then, they didn't know that. But do you know who knew that? Ellen White. Why? Because God showed her that tobacco was harmful, that it was really bad. Not only should people not smoke it, they shouldn't chew it either. In fact, there was a very funny song that the pioneers had about smoking and chewing. It's called the smoking and chewing song. You should ask your junior leaders if that's in your song list. It's about chewing and smoking and uh, chewing and spitting here and there and everywhere because it was a very bad habit. And Ellen White saw and vision that it was not pleasing to God. Not only that, but she also saw that drinking tea and coffee is bad for you. Did you know that? Yes. Did you know that caffeine is a drug? Yes. And even though you might know people who drink tea or coffee, I want to...
don't drink tea or coffee unless it's herb tea. Herb tea is fine, but the other kind of tea has caffeine, and caffeine is a drug. And Ellen White knew that, and it will get you addicted. Yes. Non-caffeinated tea, well, herb tea is fine, but even non-caffeinated tea or coffee often has a trace of caffeine. It will get you hooked, and Ellen White knew that. And after a while, your body will crave it, and there are people who get up in the morning and they're like this, oh, I need my coffee, I need my tea. You don't wanna be like that. You want a clear head, drink lots of water drink lots of water. Even if some people think it's cool to drink it, don't do it, juniors. Don't do it. You'll be so glad. And Ellen White saw that in a vision. But you know what? There were some people back then, just like there are today, who say, Ellen White, she doesn't really know. Well, maybe she's good for devotional writing and but she's not really a prophet. She doesn't really know. And there was a young man, not too much older than you, by the name of Eugene Farnsworth. The Farnsworth family, they lived in Washington, New Hampshire. Have you ever heard of that church, Washington, New Hampshire? The first Seventh Avenue Church. And Eugene Farnsworth's father, he was a leader in that church but he had a nasty little habit. Do you know what his nasty little habit was? Tobacco. And he tried to keep it a secret because he was a leader in the church. But one time, Eugene was out in the forest with his father. There was snow on the ground. His father went away. He spat the yucky, yucky tobacco on the snow, and Eugene knew that his father had this habit. But he wondered about Ellen White, and she, he knew that Ellen White was coming to speak at the Washington, New Hampshire church one Sabbath. And he said to himself, if Ellen White's a true prophet, she's going to know the secret habit of my father. She's going to know it because only God could tell it to her. Well, Ellen White came, and she had some testimonies, some special messages for people in the Washington church, and she gave them the messages from the pulpit. She stood up there and said, Sister so-and-so, Brother so-and-so, I have a message for you from the Lord. And then Eugene couldn't believe it. But Ellen White turned to his father and said, and Brother Farnsworth, you are struggling with the nasty habit of tobacco. Oh, how did she know? Eugene knew right then that she knew only because God had revealed that to her. And from then on, he realized that she was the true prophet of the Lord. Well. Ellen White, she wrote many of these testimonies, and this is pretty cool. This is back from the Adventist Heritage Village. These are some of the early ones that were first published, messages to people, case studies, that even though they were written regarding certain people back then, we still have the same kind of problems, many of the same kind of problems today. And we can read these messages and we can benefit from them. Well, probably one of the most important messages of all that God gave Ellen White and that Satan hated the very most. In fact, Satan tried to kill Mrs. White. Did you know that? He tried to kill her more than once because of this vision that God gave her. And it was in a place called Lovett's Grove in Ohio, and it was during, of all places, during a funeral. Can you imagine that, a funeral? But what happened, Sister White? Oh, I tell you, it was, it was the most amazing funeral 
that you've ever been, that I'd ever been to. And we were, the funeral was going on, and it was in Ohio, and all of a sudden, the Lord wanted to show me another one of his wonderful videos. It was a vision. And it lasted two hours. If you've ever been to a funeral, most people want to pretty much get it done and get it over with, you know, and, and move forward. But for two hours, they just had to stop and listen and wait for me. And whenever the Lord took me off into vision, I saw the history of the whole world even before, before sin entered our world. I saw when Satan was fallen from heaven. I saw sin enter the world when Adam and Eve sinned around the tree there. I saw how Jerusalem was destroyed, um, that, like Jesus told us in Matthew. I, I saw when the faithful martyrs were, were died for their faith, they were put, the, the lions ate them. Have you read those stories? They were put on poles and burned alive. I saw that in my vision. And I even saw Christians rushing into the wilderness to get away from people who wanted to kill them because they believed in the Bible. Can I see a show of hands here this afternoon? Who of you believes in the Bible? You see, if you live, thank you, if you live back in that time, you would be running for your life into the caves and the wilderness to stay safe. And then, boys and girls, I saw the world just before Jesus was ready to come. I saw moms and dads, and I saw children. I saw grandparents. You know what? I think I might even have seen some of you there. And I hope all of you. Do you understand what I mean? You, you sitting here today represent the children of long ago when I watched and I saw a vision of the soon return of Jesus and people ready for Jesus to come. And I, I just want to share with you this afternoon, this is one of the books that I wrote. This is one of my favorite books. And if you have this book at home, I want you to open the book to the last page, okay? See how much reading you got to do? It's just a short amount. But this is my favorite page in The Great Controversy. And I want to make sure that you read it. So when you go home, you read that page. And then, if that gets you kind of excited about Jesus, read chapter 37. It's about the, the, the Bible. Scriptures are safeguard. It's my favorite chapter in this book. And today, I also wrote the book Steps to Christ. One of my other very favorite books. And you're going to get one of these today, okay? And when you open this book, read page 50. It starts morning by morning, okay? One of my favorite pages in this book. Two very wonderful books because we want to be ready for Jesus to come. And these books will help you. Like I said, when Mrs. White was writing The Great Controversy, Satan was really angry. He did not want to, her to write this book. Why do you think that would be? Why would he hate this book so much? What do you think? Yes, in the green. It was talking about what he had done. Yes, it talks about what he did, how he tricked the angels in heaven. It talks about how he tricked Eve and Adam and how they fell. It talks about how God helped his people through the ages and how Satan kept trying to attack all the way down to the end of time. And it talks about how Satan tries to trick you and me today. And Satan does not want us to know that because if we know how he tricks us, then we can be better prepared and we can pray and God will help us. Well, as she was writing it, she could even sometimes feel a satanic presence around her. 
in her home in Battle Creek. Sometimes Satan, sometimes she even saw Satan and described him that he was tall and that he had a noble bearing because after all he was, even though fallen, an angel and that he had a high forehead and that it slanted back because of all the years of cruelty. Sometimes she described him when he was looking, when he could see he was just about ready to get someone in his clutches and he would have an evil smirk. She said it was terrible. Satan, my young friends, is a real being and he's after you and he's after me. But this book tells us what he's doing and how we can be safe from him. So I encourage you to read this book along with the Bible, of course. Read your Bible and pray every day. Well, in addition to writing many books, including this one, this in fact is part of a series called the Conflict of the Ages series. And it's a wonderful series that goes through the whole Bible. The first one is called, anyone know the first book in Conf Patriarchs and Prophets? What's the second book? Kings. The third book? Very good. The fourth book? And the last book, of course, is The Great Controversy. I hope each of you have this set. And if you don't, ask your parents to get it for you because it's such a blessing. But we do have a special gift for you that at the very end we're going to give you, and that's this beautiful copy of Steps to Christ. So as we're, done, we're almost done with our story, but let me just tell you, God took Ellen White not only to work here in the United States, but he took her to Europe for a while. He took her to Australia for a while, and she continued her special ministry there that God had called her to do. And he also gave her visions about some of our health institutions, some schools. Where should we put the schools? Like right here in Michigan, and like in California. Anyone here of Loma Linda? He showed Sister White a lot of important information about that. Mm -hmm. And a place near San Diego, California, mm -hmm. Paradise Valley. In fact, something very interesting happened there, didn't he? Yeah, and I want to tell him about yeah. it. But boys and girls, when I wrote these visions, there were times that I would be so weary that the people who were living with me would put my elbows up on boxes, and I would just write and write and write all night long. And sometimes an angel would appear in my window and I would enjoy seeing the angel come and it would strengthen me and I would be able to keep writing. And that's what you can read today if you choose to open these books. But I want to tell you, over the years as I receive my messages, I want to tell you a story about one of my messages. You see, God gave me a vision. It's like a video. It's a beautiful 3D, four-color picture. And, and it, he showed me a piece of land in California near San Diego. How many, anybody know where is San Diego? Anybody ever been to San Diego? I've never been there. You live in California. You know right where it's at. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so... Um, the Lord showed me this piece of land, and I told the, 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 the leaders about it from the, the conference there, and they said, oh, Sister Ellen, that land is no good. We don't want to buy any of that land. And I said to them, but the Lord gave me a vision, and he said, that land is good land. And so just because their hearts softened, they decided to buy the land. Well, you know what we do the first time we bought land way back then? We started digging for water. You can't live on a land without water. And so the diggers were digging a well and went down 10 feet, no water. 20 feet, no water. 
30 feet. They should be getting to water by now. There's an ocean right by California. You know that, don't you? No water. 40 feet. No water. 50 feet. No water. And the man that was digging the well came into my room. I had a very severe, severe cold, and I was sick at that time. And he came into my room, and he said, Sister White, I think you've made a mistake. There's no water. And I said to him, God, don't make mistakes. I said, keep digging. 60 feet. No water. Can you help me with this story? 70 feet. No water. 80 feet. No water. 90 feet. You got it all wrong on that one. She, I wrote a letter. I was so excited. I went to my desk and I wrote a letter to Mrs. Gray, and this is what I told her. I said, Mrs. Gray, Sister Gray, we have been trying to find water for two weeks, and I've been very sick with a severe cold. You will be glad to know that the, the preparations for this new hospital in San Diego is forwarding rapidly. Well, you know, the men, they've been digging a well. And they went down 90 feet before they found water. And then they went down 10 more feet just to make sure. And last evening, Brother Palmer came into my room rejoicing. He was so happy he could barely speak. A stream of water as big as his hand, and he's got the biggest hand I've ever seen. As his hand was big, it was coming into the well last night, and today we have 14 feet of soft, pure water in the well. I never saw a man more rejoiced than Brother Palmer. The thought that there was a lake of water 100 feet or more below us sent a thrill to all of our hearts. There will be more than enough water to build a hospital, to water the olive trees and the orange trees in San Diego, California. You see, my friends, my young friends, God always knows what is best. And God always keeps his promises. As our scripture reading said today, 2 Chronicles 20, 20, when we believe God's prophets and we do what they say, he will prosper us. Things will go well for us. And I hope you'll always remember that. Do you know that over the course of her lifetime, Mrs. White wrote 5,000 magazine articles. She wrote 40 books. She was the, is the most translated woman writer in the history of literature and the most translated author from America, a man or woman. She was called to her special ministry by the Lord when she was just 17 years old. And for the next 70, 70, 70 years, she faithfully followed her calling. She had more than 2,000 visions and dreams from the Lord. She was the lesser light leading to the greater light. And her gift, my young friends, is the spirit of prophecy. It is the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy that we read in the book of Revelation. And I'm so excited today that we can give you this beautiful book, The Steps to Christ, which has it has beautiful pictures for your very own. And your leader tells me that right after this you have REC. And we don't want you to have to worry about what to do with your book at REC. So after REC, you'll come back. And just before you're dismissed, they will give you your very own copy to put in your backpacks to take home so it stays nice. So thank you so much for participating in our story today.